You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. <laughs> News. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 20th of July. Strike action by a militant minority will affect games. Catholic school where 90% of the pupils are Muslim. A dark night rises. Rebels withdraw from Damascus. Commission set for fresh collision course over ACTA copycat clauses. From the belly of the beast with Nick Griffin, MEP. Thought for the day, the Margaret Walker update. Finally, sex or the Bible. UK News. Union bosses have given the go-ahead to a potentially devastating strike by border staff next week. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, last night accused a militant minority of attempting to sabotage the Olympic Games, as the walkout on Thursday could paralyse the UK's airports on the eve of the Games' opening ceremony. This strike and the fiasco over G4, security and having to bring troops in, are just several of the many setbacks these Games are facing. Most of the troops are not being paid anything like the G4 staff, and some are just back from active service. A World Date reporter commented, I personally have no time for the games, but I do feel that there is some sort of underground action going on to foul it up. Could it be coincidence that one of the union spokespersons on ITV News was a Muslim female in full Islamic dress? She was obviously enjoying the whole shebang. Put this with the sheer number of ethnics actually involved in our Olympics, and I'm not surprised things are not going according to plan. This would not have happened in China. A Catholic primary school built in the 1930s for Irish families in Birmingham is now filled with Muslim children. In fact, 90% of their intake is Muslim. Father Bernard Kelly seems quite happy with this and classes it as a changing parish. He says that these children come from Muslim families, quite happy for them to go to Christian schools. At schools, the pupils apparently hear about the teachings of Jesus, but it is not forced upon them. This September, eight out of the intake of 50 pupils will be Catholic, and they are from Polish and African families. A World Date writer comments, Well, that is a load off my mind. When I attended Catholic school as a C of E child, saints and sinners were rammed down our throats and we all expected it. Why the difference now? Surely the Roman Catholic Church has more guts to it. Why step back in the face of Islam? This school is free to these immigrants and they're not going to argue about that. So it is a bonus that their children are not being converted or indoctrinated as other non-Muslim children have been through the ages. Roman Catholic schools used to give the best secular education in the country and I think it is awful they have to change their curriculum for children who simply should not be over here in such vast numbers for the British taxpayer to pay for their education. Euronews. Now we have Nick Griffin, MEP, from the Belly of the Beast. Well, the Belly of the Beast in Brussels is empty now. The European Parliament broke up a week after Westminster, and we go back well before them. But it's still a much longer break than real people get, which considering whose sweat and taxes pays for it all, is a tad unfair. Still, at least it means a temporary respite for Britain, and especially hard-pressed British businesses, from the otherwise endless flood of meddling EU regulations and red tape, so that's got to be a plus. So I'm working on this dispatch, not in Brussels, but on the way home from an enthusiastic meeting on Tyneside last night. Everyone there was buzzing after the most successful and easily the best attended demonstration in the North East, in the entire history of the British National Party. A year or so ago, I joined our activists up there on a demo against corruption in the local Labour Council. I remember being quite pleased with a turnout of 20 or so on a working weekday. The speed and scale of a recovery from the dark days when the opposition plants and wreckers had gutted our organisation is shown by the photos and video footage from yesterday. It really is fantastic. Take a look for yourself and see. On top of a great attendance by existing activists in the region and further afield, special thanks yet again, by the way, to David Orr, and members of his elite Scottish team. We also saw the welcome return of a fair number of old hands who haven't been seen for a while, a number of new members, and, most heartening of all, members of the public who'd read about the demo in the local press and had come along to join in. Also very welcome were members of the English Defence League, defying the orders of that organisation's Zionist leadership not to join in with the British National Party efforts to raise awareness about the dangers of creeping Islamisation. On top of all the nationalists, local people, 
ranging from teenagers to housewives and to pensioners, who heard our message over the loud hailer, saw our placards and read our leaflets, then joined in our demonstration. The 15 or so communist flag-waving Islamophiles from the establishment's politically correct street thug group Unite watched with growing frustration and alarm as literally dozens of members of the public flocked to swell our crowd. By the end of the demo, the best part of 200 people had joined us in Sunderland. The atmosphere was electric, local BNP stalwart Martin Vaughan, who organised the event, told last night's meeting. It's not long since we pressured another branch of Subway to stop selling halal, and I'm confident we can do the same in Sunderland too. South Tyneside organiser Chris Thornton agrees that it was a landmark day. It was the best BNP event I've ever been on. We'll be back because we're on a roll now. It just proves that making the dif- effort makes all the difference, Chris told me last night. The speech I gave at the meeting was very different to my usual off-the-cuff delivery on our standard bread and butter issues. I touched on those at the start for the benefit of the newcomers there, but then gave a lecture-style introduction to the remarkable but complicated story of what really lies behind the manipulation of the many good people in the English Defence League. My talk was filmed by BNP TV, so I hope you'll watch it. The whole subject does take a bit of following, but if you want a glimpse into how some of the wealthiest and most corrupt corporations and individuals on the planet are running a multifaceted campaign to mould public opinion in favour of wars in which they make mind-boggling profits, then do set aside an hour to find out more, and then some more time to check out some of the culprits on the internet and confirm for yourself that everything I'm saying is true. In my talk, I touch on the use of the Hollywood movie entertainment industry to manipulate public opinion, but didn't have time to develop that important theme. So let's do that now. Give a moment's thought to the contrast between two Hollywood films, separated by several decades, but produced by the same kind of people. First, think of the early 70s film and TV series MASH. Set during the Korean War, it was, of course, designed to undermine support for the anti-communist struggle in Vietnam. Now, like most serious nationalists, I'm no fan of that war, still less of American imperialism. The phenomenal determination of the the Vietnamese underdogs was the product of their nationalism, far more than it was of communist dogma. But the vast majority of the 55,000 American boys who died there were no different to our sons, and the leftist pacifist effort to undermine their sacrifice was just part of a much wider propaganda war against people like us. Now fast forward to Black Hawk Down, the story of the ill-fated American intervention in Somalia. It's a ripping yarn in which the white man is finally shown as fighting back and taking down scores of black Muslims with him in a hail of bullets and heroic death. As you know, I'm most definitely not a Muslim sympathiser. I've spent a good decade trying to alert our slumbering countrymen and women to the dangers posed to our society, our freedoms and our children by the vicious, wicked faith of the 7th century desert. But that doesn't blind me to what Black Hawk Down and other such entertainment really is. War propaganda. Hate and violence and glory mixed into a heady cocktail designed to make young men want to kill and to risk being killed. So, while most of Hollywood spent decades striving to turn our young men into pacifist wimps, the new fashion is to wind them up for war, the endless war, planned and rolled out by the other criminal elite scum. From George Bush, Dick Cheney, and giant corporations like Halliburton, through to the neocon Tories around Cameron, like William Hague, his oil man friend Alan Duncan, Michael Gove and Liam Fox. These people have agendas and interests very far removed from the humanitarian cant that they used to herd the sheeple to be fleeced and bled in their wicked wars. The truth is out there. It will take a lot of work to get the facts into popular circulation. But thanks to the ever-growing power of the internet alternative media, it can be done, especially as we've already made a good start. Educate, agitate, organise, the far left used to say. Very good advice, and exactly what we're doing right now. World News Jessica Gawi, who was an inspiring sportscaster, was amongst the 12 victims who were gunned down in a Denver movie theatre showing a late-night screening of the new Batman film, Dark Knight Rising. Jessica, who wrote for sports blog Busted Coverage and moved from San Antonio to Denver last year, was shot after a gunman, James Holmes, for 24, broke into the Aurora Mall Cinema and fired at random 30 minutes into the Dark Knight Rises screening. The tragedy was even more poignant because Jessica had avoided another deadly shooting just weeks earlier in Eaton Mall, Toronto, where one man was killed and seven were injured on June the 2nd. There were also 38 people injured, including a three-month-old baby, and the youngest victim was just 12 years old. 
As to the killer, what are most interesting to those in the UK are the statements found in the CNN and BBC reports. CNN reports two federal law enforcement sources involved in the investigation identified the suspect as James Holmes, 24, of Aurora, Colorado. Whilst our BBC says, FBI sources named the gunman as Aurora resident James Holmes, a white American. They said no terrorism link had been established. Our reporter said the BBC has no compunction about playing the race card when it comes to white Americans. Free Syrian Army withdraw from Damascus District The Free Syrian Army withdraws from central Damascus as Syrian Army tightens the control following the Wednesday assassinations. Syrian Army forces retake Midden and border crossings. Thousands of refugees are flooding into neighbouring countries as the UN seeks a way to move forward. The EU Observer reports EU foreign ministers are to meet in Brussels this coming Monday, 23rd of July. They are expected to extend sanctions on Syria while trying to clamp down on weapons making their way to the Assad government. The move is in part to show the EU's determination to press ahead with being tough on Damascus, even after China and Russia on Thursday, 19th of July, refused to endorse global sanctions through a UN resolution. The veto by Russia and China has effectively stalemated the EU. Commission set for fresh collision course over ACTA copycat clauses. The EU Observer reports the European Commission appears set for another intellectual property rights clash with MEPs. Leaked documents reveal that proposals from the rejected counterfeit treaty ACTA are included in a draft trade agreement between the EU and Canada. Thought for the day. I have just come from the Magistrates' Court in Fareham this afternoon, where we had the second hearing for Mrs. Margaret Walker and her now famous ASBO. I arrived at the court and, of course, we had our usual supporters and a few I did not know from other groups. We also had the dubious pleasure of the great unwashed in the horrendous form of the local student Unite Against Fascism bods in a small-sized ball of miasma clinging to the rails. We left Gavin Miller, Hampshire, SRO, Steve, our Berkshire SRO, who also had charge of the camera today, and other worthies to deal with them. I did see on coming out later that the police were very pally with them, whilst although they did their jobs and kept the UAF away, they did not mingle with us nationalists at all, probably because they would forfeit their pensions. Apparently at some time during the hearing, the UAF tried to nobble the camera, but the fuzz stopped them and two people were, I believe, led away. Now to the hearing. Of course, I cannot speak about certain things, but will say that we did have a barrister present, thanks to Mike W. up north, and she was excellent. She had the interim ASBO amended so that although Mrs. Walker has another interim order, it has been changed so that she can send normal correspondence, text, emails, postcards, etc., as long as she puts her name and a return address on them. It was argued from her side that putting a total ban on all correspondence infringes on Margaret's human rights and freedoms, and that she has already ceased sending leaflets through the post. The whole kit and caboodle took hours, but the next date is the final hearing, which Margaret is defending, and will take place on the 10th and 12th of September in Fareham at the same venue. Margaret Walker is not denying she wrote and posted the said leaflets, but she is asserting that she had the right to bring certain members of the establishment facts on a few concerns and are never put on public view. She never wrote anything racially offensive, despite some witness statements, and only targeted certain councils, councillors, a pub, and M&S. That's Marks and Spencers. She deliberately avoided sending any documentation to anyone of ethnic descent or of the Muslim persuasion, because, in her words, that would be inciting hatred, which was not her aim. Some members of her family were there today to support her and she was given a lovely bunch of flowers from Gavin Miller on behalf of those present who had had a whip round. In fact, the flowers were so colour-coordinated to Gavin's outfit that we had to prize them off him in the end. There was no going into the pub today because everyone had work to do, me included, thus the news today. But rest assured, I hope we will be celebrating in September and let us hope that justice is not blind in this case. What is the system coming to when they let illegals rape and murder, and if prosecuted, serve out their light sentences in comfort, and yet they continue to harass an elderly lady over a few leaflets? Margaret was in fact harassed last week by the police, who took her down to the local station because one of the old leaflets had been readdressed so much that it had turned up on a local councillor's desk and he complained. Her interview was recorded, which it should not have been, as it was classed as informal and when Gavin Miller went down to the station to see her, he was told that Mrs Walker had never been there. 
when in fact she had been dropped home shortly before. Still, we will all keep our fingers crossed for the next bout of legal goings-on and hope that common sense will win. And finally, a vicar has condemned a hotel manager for replacing the Gideon Bible with Fifty Shades of Grey. The manager, Wayne Bartholomew, runs the 40-bedroom Damson Dean Hotel in Crosthwaite, has put the erotic bestseller by the beds of all comers, <laughs> excuse the pun, to the 40-odd bedrooms. Bartholomew is brazen about his switch and says one copy of the Gideon Bible is available at reception if anyone wants it, but they will have to ask. His defence is that the Bible is also full of references to sex and violence, and this Shades book is easier to read. But the local vicar, the Reverend Michael Woodcock, has accused the hotel boss of cashing in on the E.L. James novel's runaway success. He said, It is just a gimmick, really. It is a shame that the Bible has been taken out. This World at Eight presenter says, It is really being pushed into the public's face. Our little local library has four copies of it. Read it? Not impressed. Got the T-shirt? Not impressed. But it gives the Kama Sutra a run for its money in the boredom, not bedroom stakes. You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Moser and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and safe weekend. <laughs>